Henry David Thoreau holds a special place in American letters. He is the junior partner, if you will, of Emerson and the a long line of crackpots, quite frankly. He comes about in a uh, moment of uh, relative height of his, uh, of his pro productivity uh, in the late 1840s and early 1850s. He is, uh, that is around the time that he is writing and uh, rewriting, editing uh, Walden, his famous journal of living alone in the woods, so to speak, and also of producing in that time, a, uh, an essay, uh, Civil Disobedience. Civil Disobedience is a concentrated, focused, explicit expression of his beliefs in the, that underlay Walden, but uh, don't rise to the same level of, uh, uh, of coherence, quite frankly. In Civil Disobedience, he lays out a, uh, a stirring portrait of uh, one particular facet of the American character, particularly in the uh, in, in in that age of uh, uh, the expanding states, but also he uh, he shows a link, a very specific link between American transcendentalism and the Romantic era broadly, an era that by the mid 1800s was largely coming to a close. So he can be seen as a little bit of a transition figure for it because he is, uh, he is very much an American, very much not a European, and he, uh, he puts a kind of homey, uh, homespun character to the romantic spirit, and uh, he is quite endearing for that. Quite frankly, he's uh, he's a, a a brilliant brand, if uh, um, if nothing else. But he is many other things, quite frankly, and and he is a a, a fantastic writer. He he writes some really thrilling and and uh, clarifying prose. That uh, whether you believe uh, whether you believe in what he's saying or not is is admirably stirring. So this essay comes out as a re reaction to his being uh, uh, arrested for not paying taxes, and he spends a night in jail. And he comes out and he immediately prepares some lectures on that. He gives it at the Concord Lyceum, I believe. And it is a, uh, it's a hit and people, uh, people lap it up. And so he refashions his, uh, his lecture into an essay form and publishes, his, publishes it as resistance to civil government. And later the, uh, the, the, the title gets sort of rehabbed into civil disobedience, but you can find it in either, uh, either form. And it's a, uh, it, it is a, it's a really fascinating expression of Americanism of a particular cast. You can see the elements of New England specifically within it, that, uh, that New England, uh, Puritan background, the dissenters, the Mayflower people who were very singular minded, very focused, not particularly neighborly to begin with, a little bit crusty as uh, New Englanders can be up there in the cold, but also um, highly moralistic, highly uh, motivated uh, by, their, uh, by their convictions, by their moral and religious and, uh, and spiritual convictions to act in opposition to any force trying to encroach upon it. And of course, the, uh, this is a long tradition in, uh, in America. The, the pilgrims, so to speak, again, particularly in the, uh, the North, the pilgrims were reacting, resisting the government of England, telling them that they had to worship in a certain way. And so they left there. So that, that notion of government resistance was just baked into the uh, the character of New England, and of course that's where you find uh, in the the early days of uh, of, of America under the uh, the Washington administration you have Shays Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, all of this resistance to the idea of government, which uh, of course is uh, a problematic 
issue when you're looking at the history of American letters. And we don't need to get into all that very specifically, but you look at characters like New England's John Adams, who was not necessarily a uh, a no government man, as uh, as Thoreau might uh, might call it. He uh, Adams had a very conflicted uh, position as a revolutionary, in that he genuinely liked law and order and government and civil society broadly, and so there there is that very clear thread running through U.S. history and finding a particular um, uh, a particular inflection point, I think, with Thoreau, <clears throat> who begins uh, this, uh, this essay in, in fairly sweeping and really quite charming tones, even if it, it, uh, it, it rings a little hollow to us in the modern day as warmed over libertarian claptrap. I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also, I believe, that government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which, will, which they will have. Government is, at best, but an expedient. But most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against a standing army, and they are many and weighty and deserve to prevail, may also be brought against a standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican war, the work of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool. For, in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. Now, there you can see him referencing very explicitly right at the beginning, beginnings and endings, right at the beginning, the Mexican War, the Mexican-American War, which many historians will say was American expansionism, uh, run a little bit amok, and for, uh, for Thoreau, it is part and parcel with slavery. He doesn't really mention that here. He's soft peddling it, but the uh, the notion of uh, an individual supporting something they don't believe in uh, in the uh, an action of the federal government, an individual supporting that with their taxes, is the uh, the the nub of his uh, of his concern here. Whether or not he's uh, how other historians. Actual historians can go and explore the, uh, the 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 level of concern that he uh, that he expresses for for slavery, but broadly speaking, he is uh, objecting to the idea that the government would do something with my money, my money, my authority as an individual is then being usurped to serve this larger cause of the federal government with which I have some objections, or for which, about which I have some objections. And uh, that is the core of his problem. That is the core of his complaint. And there, uh, this is completely familiar in, uh, in, in politics of that era. Uh, famously, the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison uh, uh, rejected all sorts of uh, um, laws, let's say, or argued against them very forcefully on the basis of a kind of Christian pacifism. I will not fight. I will not object. I will not do anything other that is in conflict with my individual personal religious beliefs, conscientious objector stuff, uh, but still uh, in opposition to democratic norms. Uh, and this is obviously somewhat tied to certain uh, anarchist um, uh, movements that are bubbling up around the world, in France very notably with Proudhon, and the, the belief that you can reject the idea of civil society 
if it does not comport with your core beliefs. And that is, uh, let's say, a ripe thread of, uh, of, of thought within, uh, within the whole discourse around the, uh, the social contract. Uh, but is it necessarily constructive? What is interesting about this, and I don't need to go off on the, uh, on, on, on the hoo-ha that becomes libertarianism and all of the, uh, you know, the, these opening lines are quoted by every half-wit politician from, uh, uh, from then until now. So put that aside. Whether or not you believe in libertarianism is completely up to you. And it is obviously a thread within uh, the American fabric that we need to be aware of and we need to be able to recognize. But uh, this is not the place to argue against that specifically. Even so, as Thoreau is laying out his argument, even he seems a little iffy on sometimes. That's the first paragraph I just read. There's another beefy one right after that. These are fairly long paragraphs too, comparatively speaking. But then he follows it, follows those two with a fairly short paragraph. But to speak practically and as a citizen, unlike those who call themselves no government men, I ask for not at once no government, but at once a better government. Let every man make known what kind of government would command his respect, and that will be one step closer to obtaining it. <laughs> now, uh, I love that first note where he says, well, to speak practically, as if everything he said before then has been completely impractical and just silly, and now I'm just going along with the dream here. But then he undercuts himself, or seems to and says that, well, no, I'm not for no government. I'm not an anarchist, for God's sakes. I just believe in the individual supreme over the group. Let every man make known what kind of government would command his respect, and that will be one step forward in obtaining it. Let every man know what kind of government would command his respect. So, under this, you would think the federal government needs to go on a fact-finding tour of every individual in the nation, knock on their door, and interview them and say, well, okay, you know, okay, what, kind, what would you like? And then they work backward from that, say, well, okay. <laughs> but the, obviously this is impractical, this is, uh, this is harebrained, but it does say that it is prioritizing the individual, the rugged individual that is, of course, going to be morally right, going to be correct, and everything can, st can flow from that. That individual uh, character of the uh of the american uh you can see even though he's you know he, he he's he, he is very much the new england boy here uh you can see the idea of the cowboy coming out of this as well the rugged individualism of it uh even in the face of all um uh ridicule that it invites quite frankly it is asinine to think that this is uh plausible and so he after saying but uh, just to be practical about this i love this he lays out this pipe dream in the first two paragraphs and then interjects with a note but just to be practical about it and then he continues to lay out the pipe dream which is in no way practical and seems to make that explicit it makes you almost wonder if he's being ironic i don't think he is but something's not adding up here he's not dumb he has to understand something but it's the dwelling on the individual and the individual sense of morality specifically that ties transcendentalism to the broader romantic movement. Must the citizen ever for a moment or in the least degree resign his conscience to the legislator? Why has every man a conscience then? I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right 
The only obligations I would have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. Oh! <laughs> Again, it sounds really quite sell is thrilling, quite frankly. Uh, he takes the cheap shot at the lawmaker, the legislator. Oh, those people in Congress. Uh, cheap shot. But it seems unimaginable to him that the individual human heart, the conscience, could ever be wrong about anything. Or that everybody else wouldn't naturally adhere to that individual heart. Because he's imagining that everybody is part of the same. And here we're getting into some more of the more abstract elements of, uh, uh, of transcendentalism with the oversoul and all of that. But his belief is that every individual heart will resound to the same tune when approached as individuals. And when you respect the individual integrity of every human being, you automatically come to an interior uh, but also universal good. And that good is, for him, conscience. The idea that an individual will stand up and say, I think we should do this. And then everybody else, judging as individuals, would say, you're right, that's brilliant, we should do that. Which is okay, that is democracy, uh, that is how the democratic system works. The same democratic system that uh, Thoreau seems to be poo-pooing here. But at the same time, it is completely impractical in what is, at this point, a very rapidly growing nation. Uh, Thoreau's whole idea in Walden is to go live by himself off in the woods in a kind of experiment in primitivism. Uh, how little can I get by on? This is what we should all do, is live alone in the woods. Uh, all right, that's his little, that's his little parlor trick. Who cares? But it denies the idea of a rapidly growing society. It denies the idea of rapidly growing cities and urban centers and immigration, quite frankly, huge boatloads of people, primarily at this stage, Irish are coming over and there, there's obviously a huge undercurrent of anti-Irish and uh, anti-European, anti-immigrant broadly uh, propaganda in, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the culture that he is sort of floating along the surface of here. But the, uh, the, the idea that, well, no, we, we need to be less complicated. We need to be less, uh, um, uh, less polyphonic. We need to have a simple American character that everybody recognizes and uh, our hearts will beat as one. That is uh, obviously really, really problematic. The mass of men serve the state thus not as men mainly, but as machines with their bodies. They are the standing army and the militia, jailers, constables, posse comitatus, etc. In most cases, there is no free exercise whatever of the judgment or of the moral sense, but they put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stones, and wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose as well. Such command no more respect than men of straw or a lump of dirt. They have the same sort of worth only as horses and dogs. Yet such as these men are commonly esteemed good citizens, Others, as most legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, and office holders, serve the state chiefly with their heads. And, as they rarely make any moral distinctions, they are as likely to serve the devil, without intending it, as God. A very few, as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers, in the great sense, and men, serve the state with their consciences also, and so necessarily resist it for the most part, and they are commonly treated as enemies by it. Now, again, the politics of this are really pretty uh, ripe, and this is giving cover to a whole host of, um, well, uh, right-wing crackpots. 
uh, the, 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 the word martyrs in this, are you willing to die for your cause, uh, opens up all sorts of associations in the modern day. And that is really, really, really disturbing. But also the, uh, the equation of, uh, of, of men who go along with civil society as lumps of dirt, uh, you know, or men of straw or horses or dogs, animals, uh, that's really concerning. The mass of men serve the state thus, not as men, but as machines with their bodies. The, this is, quite frankly, this is Marxism coming up in a different corner of the world at roughly the same time. Uh, this is Proudhon. This is, uh, this is uh, the alienation of the individual. And it's just pointing to a different remedy. But it is still a rejection of uh, government authority, the uh, the rejection of a democratic process, the rejection of civil society and the social contract broadly. This uh, obviously has some, some issues with the modern day martyrs. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. Martyrs is loaded, loaded language. And the idea that you can resist it and be a hero and yet still by the government be considered an enemy. It's again this this complete oppositional approach to society. You are an individual opposed to society broadly, not just government, but society and the whole working of society. He says that government is just a tool of the uh, society and, uh, earlier, and essentially it is, but here you can see a real hostility taking place between these two. The rejection of society broadly, the rejection of government broadly, devolves even further into a rejection of uh, the democratic process. All voting is a sort of gaming, like checkers or backgammon, with a slight moral tinge to it, a playing with right and wrong, with moral questions, and betting natural accompanies, and betting naturally accompanies it. The character of the voters is not staked. I cast my vote perchance as I think right, but I am not vitally concerned that right should prevail. I am willing to leave it to the majority. Its obligation, therefore, never exceeds that of expediency. Even voting for the right is doing nothing for it. It is only expressing to men feebly your desire that it should prevail. A wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. There is but little virtue in the action of, of masses of men, when the majority shall at length vote for the abolition of slavery, it will be because they are indifferent to slavery, or because there is but little slavery left to be abolished in their vote. They will then be the only slaves. Only his vote can hasten the abolition of slavery, who asserts his own freedoms by his vote. Okay. Uh, one guy can bring down slavery because he is morally correct. The one correct individual rises above the majority and here he is arguing that well okay voting doesn't matter voting is silly it's all rigged it's all rigged it's, it's childish it's asinine it is dangerous anti-democratic uh behavior wrapped in this cloak of righteousness and the, the it is a really it is a powder keg that has been uh burning down ever since in this society the dismissing of voting the di dismissing of legislators and lawmakers and politicians also notably ministers in that uh somebody who's responsible for a uh for a group of people a minister Emerson sort of started as a minister, so you gotta wonder if he's taking a little shot at Emerson there. But the uh, the the relentless attack on any group activity, any 
group understanding of a group as a group is uh, hostile to individualism and so must be undercut, must be destroyed in a sense, because the individual is always primary. And then he gets down after a, a long a, a, a long disquisition on these beliefs in, uh, in various uh, estimations, dropping in some concerns about uh, prison and jail throughout, just sort of warming up the crowd a little bit with this, uh, what started as a lecture. You can see him really sort of feeding off this populist feel. This isn't written in a, uh, you know, in a library necessarily. This is catering to a crowd. So in a way, it is socially constructed itself. It starts as a lecture in a small town in Massachusetts, not a particularly broad-based uh, thing, but still he is building this out of a kind of popular movement. So, you know, well, you know, some groups are better than others, and that's basically what this is boiling down to. Some groups are righteous, made of, of rugged individualists, and they're all rugged individualists in this room, but over there, I gotta wonder about them. Of course it's BS. But then he finally gets down to telling the tale of his stay in jail. And, of course, he wraps himself in, a, uh, in, in that character of being, you know, unjustly uh, uh, persecuted by the law. Hmm. I don't know, have we ever heard that before? And this does give you uh, a, a clear understanding, I think, of his position in terms of authority, outside authority, federal support, the authority broadly, governmental authority more broadly, but the whole idea of any group, any plurality, majority, whatever you want to call it, coming and trying to assert its will to co-opt the will of the sacred individual. I have paid no poll tax for six years. I was put into jail once on this account for one night. And as I stood considering the walls of solid stone, two or three feet thick, the door of wood and iron, a foot thick, and the iron grating which strained the light, I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones to be locked up. I wondered that it should have concluded at length that this was the best use that it could put me to, and had never thought to avail itself of my services in some way. I saw that, if there was a wall of stone between me and my townsmen, there was a still more difficult one to climb or break through before they could get to be as free as I was. I did not for a moment feel confined, and the walls seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. I felt as if I alone, of all my townsmen, had paid my tax. They plainly did not know how to treat me, but behaved like persons who are underbred. <sighs> underbred? Uh Underbred is a uh, is, is obviously a little suggestive there, uh, and perhaps uh, it is simply a sense of well, social reading. You know, you are not you did not have good parents. Um, uh, perhaps that you know you were not raised in a good home. But underbred, obviously, there's a. There's a little bit of a eugenics argument there, uh, and I shudder to think what people with a uh, with a greater education in the science of genetics would read that line as, and what license they would feel that it gives them. But also that that uh, the the condescension quite frankly of everything around him they they did not know how to treat me. Why lock me up? My service. You could make use of my services. I could be used for so many things. 
uh, you know, like what? I mean, he doesn't. <laughs> he was a writer. He was a lecturer. Uh, he he was a businessman. His family owned a uh, a were, were pencil manufacturers. All of his walks in the woods were about scouting trees to chop down <laughs> rather than great environmental excursions. But um, you can see a a certain befuddlement. The idea. Why am I being locked? This is silly. He cannot see or he refuses to see perhaps the, the other side of it. So he's really not taking on the argument so much there. But also, again, the, 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 the idea of the material versus the immaterial. He looks at all, he says, you know, I'm looking at all of the, the walls, uh, you know, the, the walls uh, of solid stone, two or three feet stick, the door of wooden iron, a foot thick, and the iron grating, which strains the, all. These things are material, and they're trying to hold me in with them, and they are holding my body in, but my body is not the important part. The material world is irrelevant. What matters is my soul. You locked me up, but my soul is free. Uh, borrowing a little from this is a concern of uh, that that he might be taking from uh, democracy in America with Tocqueville. The uh, the, the the supremacy, the uh, the the uh, indomitability of the individual human soul soars beyond the crude matter of the stone, the crude matter of the walls, of the jail. And uh, that is romanticism, quite frankly. He does, he celebrates himself for this and he talks about how uh, he spent the night there and he talked with his cellmate and he seems to have gotten fairly good uh, treatment while he was there and it was only one night and the next morning uh, somebody bailed him out. Most scholars say that it was probably like a, a, a relative, somebody who has some money. So he was in jail on a political point and then in the morning... Uh, okay, I spent the night in jail. I had a I had a crude breakfast, and they put me out to to work in a field for a couple of hours, maybe. But realistically, yeah, it wasn't so bad. And uh, in the morning, you know, I got bailed out because I have uh, I have family, I have some means, and uh, I have privilege. Let's say is a uh, is, is perhaps in the current par parlance, but he is not necessarily acknowledging that. He's treating himself like, well, I'm just one of the boys in there. Uh, obviously, hypocrisy meter is going a little nuts, but. He does then ultimately admit that it's not necessarily all taxes, he says, that he refuses to pay, but he wants to be the judge. I have never declined paying the highway tax because I am as desirous of being a good neighbor as I am of being a bad subject. And as for supporting schools, I am doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. It is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state, to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually. I do not care to trace the course of my dollar if I could till it buys a man or a musket to shoot one with. The dollar is innocent. But I am concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, I quietly declare war with the state after my fashion, though I will still make what use and get what advantage I can of her I can, as is usual in such cases. Now, obviously, the get what use of the state that he can, as is usual in such cases, little hypocrisy there. Um, you know, sure, I'll take advantage of it. But uh, the the core in there is still quite frankly, disturbing. I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state. Refuse allegiance to the state. Well, he's refusing to pay the poll tax, uh, and which he is sort of picking out, it seems at random. 
but picking out like, well, okay, he starts by saying, you know, I, uh, I'll i pay the highway tax because I want to be a good neighbor. Uh, but you, you get the sense of neighbor as somebody that you kind of watch. Again, that New England uh, characterization of neighbor. Think of oh, good fences make good neighbors from, from Frost a few years later, a few decades later. Uh, the idea that, oh, a neighbor is somebody you look at from over there. Okay, you stay on your side. This is my property. I'm going to stay here and there's a wall between it. I think that is kind of what's going on there. But he does admit to paying some taxes. I'll pay some taxes, just not this one or just not that one. Or, you know, I will decide. The celebration of the individual. The sovereignty of the individual is sacrosanct here. As for supporting schools, I am doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. By speaking in the Lyceum or by printing this up and distributing copies around his town, he is educating the public. Obviously, this is completely impractical. This is, this is more libertarian claptrap. But uh, realistically, he sees that his genuine, sincere effort to educate a small minority would then be enough because he is viewing this culture, this society through rather constricted lenses of individuality, small, small, small society, everybody kind of the same and respecting each other's personal space personal liberty, uh, it, it is not particularly well suited to what America is becoming in the middle of the 1800s. They who know of no purer sort sources of truth, who have traced up its stream no higher, stand and wisely stand by the Bible and the Constitution, and drink at it there with reverence and humility. But they who behold where it comes trickling into the lake or that pool gird up their loins once more and continue their pilgrimage towards it, its fountainhead. Uh, obviously, the Bible and the Constitution held up in parallel there. Uh, re religiosity, theocracy, and all of that um, uh, have a, a troubling relationship with, uh, with the U.S. Constitution, let's say. Um, we don't need to go, uh, go into that. But that belief in right, which he is saying you can find in the Constitution, but I'm wondering what clauses he's specifically looking at. Uh, beyond perhaps the First Amendment or the first part of the First Amendment, what part of that is he really latching on to? Because he seems to reject uh, democracy in all forms, uh, republicanism in all forms, government in all forms. And the Constitution is a document of government. It is about instituting a government within society so that you can protect against um, anarchy on one hand and totalitarianism on the other. And Thoreau seems to be repeatedly um, reaching after those two and throwing constitutional republicanism under the bus. But then at the end, he comes back to his core point. Very well constructed. He knows how to make an argument. He would make a fine, fine lawyer, even though he seems to hate lawyers, but honestly, who doesn't? He comes back to his point at the end and makes it in a very explicit uh, fashion in a way that sums up his position clearly and uh, does what Walden can never really quite do in its more complicated project. There will never be a really free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as higher and independent power from which all its own power and authority are derived and treats him accordingly. I please myself with imagining a state at last which can afford to be just to all men and to treat individual 
the individual with respect as a neighbor, which even would not think it inconsistent with its own repose if a few were to live aloof from it, not meddling with it, nor embraced by it, who fulfilled all the duties of neighbors and fellow men. A state which bore this kind of fruit and suffered it to drop off as fast as it ripened would prepare the way for a still more perfect and glorious state, which also I have imagined, but not yet anywhere seen. Now that ending seems to be saying, I can see where we're going. I have a goal. We need to go there. And where is there? Well, there is nullifying the state. There is nullifying government of any kind. There is a utopian dream of rugged individualism where the simple, pure-hearted individual, natural man, is his own sovereignty. The rejection of government, the rejection of society is complete. He respects neighbors, but again, that, that focus on neighbors and not groups of any kind. A neighbor is, uh, again, largely an individual, an autonomous unit adjacent to yours. There is no sense that there could be any conflict there, but only a an expression of wary awareness and um, respect, but what if that neighbor has a different idea? What if that neighbor woo, wants to stay up really late and make a lot of noise so that it keeps anybody up at night? And who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters. No, and not police, because no. Police would be a, an agent of, uh, like the standing army, would be an agent of government. It is a compelling vision of America and a compelling vision of the American, which at this point in history is still coming about and people aren't really sure what to make of it. You have the stirring images of the revolution and the culture broadly is still struggling to assert a particular character. Emerson had come out with his uh, his famous call uh, very recently uh, for a for an uh, for an American character to its culture, for its art, for its writers and musicians and whatever. Breaking free of the European models, breaking free of the constrictions to celebrate the individual character and. This sets the mold. This creates a kind of American that, as an image, exists to this day. This somewhat dangerous image of uh, rugged individualism. Thoreau is a very clear writer. He's very brilliant in many respects, and he throws off lines that just ring. Uh, here and there, and obviously very, very quotable. Um, uh, unfortunately, all the worst people quote him, quite frankly. <laughs> it would be great if he wasn't for the people, which also, okay, look at me. That is a kind of Thoreauian uh, argument there. You know, it, this stuff would be great if it wasn't for the, for the, for the, for the masses of people who misuse it. Uh, they don't have the purity of heart that I do. So you see, th this is not that far afield. We are all a part of this project in America. We are all um, built from this mold, so to speak. It's just that the mold has variations in it. The mold has complications and other influences throughout that uh, pull it in different directions. And the mold being a mold in its original form can't necessarily withstand that outward pressure. So it crumbles. 
Thoreau lays out a great argument. Thoreau makes this all very, very explicit, and it is a thrill to read, and probably a, uh, a more interesting read for the average reader than Walden, where you're sitting there and it's like, oh, wow, you spent how much on pencils that day or whatever, and you know, who really cares? But this is a clear idea of his beliefs. This is a explicit declaration of independence from the state for the individual. And there he makes his case, he makes it very forcefully, he makes it very, uh, very clearly in very stirring language that is obviously coming out of a, a lecture format where he is performing it publicly. It has that kind of uh, jingoistic quality at times where he's pointing to, you know, the man is, he's the bad one. All of us normal people in this room, we're all good. And it, it's got that populist feel to it that he, 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 he develops just brilliantly in, uh, in this essay. So as a, as a matter of style, it's spectacular. As a matter of substance, it is often quite laughable. But you cannot deny its value in style and substance, its value to the formation of the American character in American culture broadly.